part four of four. Now let me return back to the discussion of the assassination itself. The bankers who wanted the president assassinated had used the Knights of the Golden Circle and the Masonic Lodge to carry out their plans. And they asked John Wilkes Booth, who was a member of both, to carry out their plans. This is a photograph of Mr. Booth giving the sign that he was a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. And these are two photographs showing that John Wilkes Booth was a member of the Masonic Lodge. And to show you, like father, like son, this is a photograph of Junius Brutus Booth, the father of John Wilkes Booth. This is a book entitled The Assassination and History of the Conspiracy by Bert James Lowenberg. It was originally published only four months after the assassination of the president in 1865, and it reported this order, meaning the Knights of the Golden Circle, originated the plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Yet I defy you to find one reference to them in nearly any book or textbook you will read about the Civil War. The Knights have been officially buried. After the shooting, Stanton issued orders to northern troops to block the exit ways out of Washington, D.C. It was presumed that Booth would want to escape the city that night, and Stanton moved to block his escape routes. There were eight roads leading out of the city that could have been traveled by Booth after he had shot the president, and Booth happened to travel out on the one known as the Navy Yard Bridge, and Stanton failed to blockade that exit. He issued no orders to troops to blockade only this one exit of the eight. This was a real photograph of that bridge taken at the time of Booth's escape. The bridge led to the state of Maryland and then to the south. Yet as far as I can determine, there was no investigation as to why Stanton failed to send troops to block the exit that Booth traveled on to escape to the south. But I'm certain that this was just an inadvertent mistake. History has recorded that Booth was killed in a barn in Maryland on April the 26th, 11 days after Lincoln was assassinated. But Booth did not die in the barn after all, because it was another man, a southern captain by the name of James William Boyd, who was shot. Please notice the amazing similarity between these two men. It is now known that prior to being in the barn, Boyd had been found in a northern prison with a badly wounded right leg, and he was ordered to a prison near Washington, D.C. by Edwin Stanton before the shooting. Somehow Stanton must have brought Captain Boyd to the farmhouse so that he could be shot by Union troops and then he, Stanton, would certify that it was the real John Wilkes Booth. After Booth was shot, Stanton then had the body taken to a Navy ship, the Montauk, anchored in the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. I think it is a fair assumption to make that Stanton wanted as few people as possible to watch the proceedings as he observed the body, and that would exclude the press. So he sent the body to a ship where he could limit access to only those who he knew would not report later that it was not Booth's body that was examined. It was here that Stanton certified that the body of Boyd was the body of John Wilkes Booth. However, there were at least four major differences between the two men, which Stanton could have noted if he had honestly conducted a review of the facts. Boyd was in his 40s, and Booth was 26. Boyd had a wounded right leg, and Booth had 
broken his left leg after he assassinated the president. Both men had mustaches. Booth had shaved his off after the shooting during his visit in the home of Samuel Mudd, a doctor who treated him for his broken leg. And this fact was known before the troops went to the farm and found Booth. Booth had, Boyd had reddish brown hair and Booth had coal black hair. Just as an observation, I've watched many History Channel documentaries about the assassination of President Lincoln, and several of these have quoted various reports of those who observed Stanton conducting his investigation to see if the body was that of John Wilkes Booth, and those other reports have quoted those who saw that the body had reddish brown hair, not black. Edwin Stanton had the body of Booth buried inside an army fort so that no one would be able to dig it up and confirm that it was not the body of John Wilkes Booth in the grave. So it was the body of James William Boyd that was buried in the grave as John Wilkes Booth. Sometime later, the body was dug up and reburied in the Green Mount Ceremony Cemetery in Baltimore, Maryland. Several years later, in 1986, relatives of Mr. Booth wanted his body exhumed because they suspected that it was not the body of the real Booth buried in the grave. This is an article that appeared in my local newspaper in July of 2000, and it reported that the cemetery refused to allow it, and the Maryland court refused in June of 1986 to let the body be exhumed. Later on, a Maryland Court of Special Appeals affirmed that the cemetery had the right to control their cemetery. I just wonder if someone in the court system knew, even in 1986 or 2000, that John Wilkes Booth had survived the shooting in the barn and that the body of James William Boyd was buried in Booth's place. One can only conclude by these facts that Stanton was a major player in the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. And John Wilkes Booth lived on. Booth kept a diary during his days after the assassination and it is currently on display at the Forge Museum in Washington, D.C. You will notice that 18 pages of it have been cut out probably by a knife. It has been reported that the diary was given to Stanton with all of its pages intact. These missing pages were reportedly found by Joseph Lynch, who was appraising the Stanton collection of papers in 1974. These pages became the basis of a book entitled The Lincoln Conspiracy by David Balsiger and Charles Sillier, published in 1977. As you can see, a movie by that name was made and distributed around America. The two authors say this about the missing 18 pages. The diary mentions the names of 70 prominent people directly and indirectly involved in Booth's plan. And the book at least book identifies at least three of Booth's conspirators as being Jay Cook, a banker, his brother Henry Cook, also a banker, and Thurlow Weed, a New York newspaper publisher. The book actually called Jay Cook a, quote, banking tycoon, end quote. And that makes me suspicious that this brother was the contact man between the European bankers who wanted Lincoln assassinated and John Wilkes Booth. I would like to end the discussion of the Civil War with an interesting sidelight to this enormous assassination story. I was once invited to speak in Dearborn, Michigan, and my host suggested that we should visit the Henry Ford Museum, and I found two parts 
of this puzzle there. The rocking chair that President Lincoln was seated in at the Ford Theater that night has been preserved at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. If you look at the top of the back, you will see the blood stains of Lincoln's head wound after being shot. It is rather ironic that this rocking chair is displayed only a few feet away from the limousine manufactured by the Lincoln division of the Ford Motor Company that President John Kennedy was seated in when he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas in 1963. I wonder if it is only a coincidence that there have been only two presidents in the history of the United States that have issued money that was not borrowed from any central bank and those two presidents were Abraham Lincoln and John Kennedy and that both of them have been assassinated. I'm certain that this is only an amazing coincidence. I would now like to spend some time discussing the time after the Civil War and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. The Chamber of Commerce in Granbury, Texas believes that John Wilkes Booth worked as a bartender in that city for several years after his alleged shooting in the barn. This is an article in the February 19, 2007 edition of the Chattanooga Times Free Press. And as you can see, the headline reads, Did John Wilkes Booth Survive? The article discussed the evidence that an historian elected for 40 years that the assassin of Lincoln lived past his reported death in the barn in 1865. That certainly supports my research of about 30 years that Booth survived the shooting in the barn. Mr. Booth had developed a weakness for alcohol after he assassinated the president and he started drinking too heavily and was revealing his true identity. That was contrary to the oath of secrecy he had taken as a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. Stories to this effect reached Jesse James, who was at that time the leader of the Knights of the Golden Circle, and he knew that he had to silence the assassin. He found Booth staying in a rooming house in Eden, Oklahoma, on January the 13th, 1903, 38 years after Booth had allegedly been shot in the barn. Dalton reported that he had been providing Booth with $300 a month to live on from the money of the Knights organization. Now Booth had taken this oath as a member of the Knights. I will solemnly keep all secrets of the Golden Circle and I will faithfully perform whatever I may be commanded. Dalton gave Booth two glasses of lemonade laced with arsenic, and Booth drank both of them and died in the presence of Dalton, his superior inside the Knights of the Golden Circle. Of course, Booth knew him as William Andrews Clark. The owner of the rooming house went to Booth's room several days later because he had not seen him and found the body laying in his bed. The body had mummified from the arsenic so that it would not need to be embalmed. There is some further evidence that Dalton's story about poisoning Booth might be true. The Oklahoma City Daily newspaper published an article several months later. These are excerpts from that article. Enid, Oklahoma, June the 2nd, 1903. Further evidence is at hand that the man who died here last January and was supposed by some to be John Wilkes Booth was really that man. He has been identified by John's brother, his nephew, Junius Brutus Booth, and others who knew Booth during the war. The rooming house owner sold the mummied <laughs> the mummified body of Booth to someone connected with a traveling road show, and he featured the body as being that of Booth and charged an admission price to see it. 
Life magazine did a photographic feature on this mummy in its July 11, 1938 issue. And this is, of course, the head of that mummy. The article accompanying the photograph stated that doctors in 1938 had examined the mummy's left leg and had discovered that it had been broken, just as reported by the witnesses at the theater in 1865 after Booth jumped to the stage. The Hood County News of June 21, 1997 printed an article that amplified these comments by life. They reported that a team of six physicians x-rayed the remains and they re revealed that the mummy had a healed left ankle fracture and a deformed right thumb. It is known that Booth had injured his thumb during a stage accident that occurred during his acting career. There is one more detail to discuss about the involvement of Russia in our civil war. President, 18, President <laughs> in 1867, Vice President Andrew Johnson, who moved up to the presidency after the Lincoln assassination, received a bill from the Russian government for $7.2 million for the use of their fleet. Johnson knew that there was no constitutional authority to take $1 of American taxpayers' money to give to a foreign nation. The only way he could do so was to buy land, as this nation did in buying the Louisiana Purchase from France in 1803. So our nation bought Alaska as a way of paying Russia for the use of its fleet and for saving the North during the Civil War. And once again, I ask you to find one Civil War history book that mentions this fact, and I will say that you will not. There is one final chapter on the Andrew Johnson story. On February the 25th, 1868, the House of Representatives voted to impeach the president for, quote, high crimes and misdemeanors, end quote. Many historians have wondered what the motive was for such an extreme charge. And I think it was because the conspiracy that assassinated the president knew that President Johnson was committed to the same post-war strategy with regards to the South after the war was over. Lincoln wanted to welcome the southern states back to the Union with one condition. The South must repudiate the southern debt of the war. It means that the South could not redeem all of the bonds the Southern government had sold to investors to raise money for the war effort. If the international bankers had loaned the South the money to finance the war, they would not get their money back. This, <laughs> this certainly did not endear Lincoln and Johnson to the bankers who had financed the South with the loans they made to the Southern government. This condition was quite likely the second reason the bankers wanted Lincoln out of office and also Mr. Vice President, now President Johnson, removed as well. The first was, of course, the fact that Lincoln had financed the Northern War effort by printing the greenback dollar, which means he did not borrow the money from the international bankers. So it is my opinion that the bankers decided that Lincoln had to be removed from office. I would presume his assassination would be a reminder to future presidents that they should never refuse a loan being offered to them by the bankers from Europe. And he was, by John Wilkes Booth, a member of both the Masons and the Knights of the Golden Circle. As I said, President Johnson pledged to continue the policies of Lincoln after his acceptance of the presidency. And the bankers had removed this new president and a vote was held in the Senate. 
The Senate needed 36 votes to remove the president from office, and they had 35 senators pledged to a removal vote. There was only one senator, Edmund G. Ross of Kansas, who had pledged to be neutral until he had studied the facts before he would cast his vote in the roll call. One historian that I read wrote that Senator Ross made this comment about his vote. I almost literally looked down into my open grave. That sounds like he knew the importance of the vote and who wanted him to vote for the removal of the president's and he studied the facts and voted not guilty. So Johnson stayed in power and the money power failed in their second attempt to remove a sitting president. But it was only a temporary setback because they had plans that they could set in place even with President Johnson still in the presidency. There is one more story to tell before I close the chapter on the Civil War. Dalton explained what those plans were in a book entitled Jesse James and the Last Cause. Dalton said that the Knights of the Golden Circle wanted to promote another dreadful and bloody Civil War that they wanted to put on a greater war than the first. And to add a postscript on the presidency of Andrew Johnson, he was quoted as saying, I have no doubt that there is a conspiracy afoot among the radicals to incite another revolution. So this is another reason that the conspiracy wanted the president removed from office. He knew of their plans. And to do so, the Knights and certain of the high-ranking members of the Masons created the Ku Klux Klan, abbreviated to the three letters KKK. They formed it in 1867. Their purpose was to stir up a race war between the whites and the blacks to provoke another civil war. When I was in high school, I learned about a slogan of the South, the meaning of which was never explained to me. And that was the slogan, the South shall rise again. I would presume that I must have presumed that it meant that the South would rise from the ashes of the Civil War. But now I think it was written by the Knights as a way of preparing the South to accept a second Civil War. So while I am here discussing the flag of the South, I would like to show you another connection to the Masonic Lodge. You will notice that there are 13 stars on this flag. This is, of course, the flag of the United States, and there are 50 stars on it, each one representing one of the 50 states. So if the Confederacy had intended one star to represent each of the states that seceded, there would have been 11, 11 stars on their flag, but there were, as I said, 13. Now, one could argue that the South was hoping that two more states would secede to become part of the Confederacy. But the truth is that this flag was adopted in 1863, about in the middle of the Civil War. And between 1861, when the war started, and 1863, no other states joined the South. This is a rather poor quality photocopy of a brief article written in the April 1960 New Age magazine, the official magazine of the 33rd Degree Council in Washington, D.C. As you can see on the bottom of the article, it was written to show the, quote, Masonic symbols in a one dollar bill, end quote. And it reports how many times the number 13 shows up on both sides of the dollar bill. So it appears as if the number and 
some significance hidden by the Masons. It is one of their symbolic numbers. I think it is just another concealed example showing us how influential the Masons were in both sides of the Civil War. The acknowledged founder of the Ku Klux Klan was former Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, a member of the Masonic Lodge. Here is the General's brief biography in the Masonic volume entitled 10,000 Famous Freemasons, acknowledging that the General was a member. This is Albert Pike once again, and I will repeat the statement that he was the leader of the worldwide Masonic movement between 1859 and 1891. That means he was in office when the Ku Klux Klan was formed in 1867. This is Coyle's Masonic Encyclopedia, authored by Henry Wilson Coyle and edited by three other 33rd degree Masons. And this is the title page where you can see the pictures of Henry Wilson Coyle and the other 33 degree Masons. Also notice that the book was being published by the McCoy Masonic Supply Company. And this is the heading of an entry entitled Secrets and Secret Societies found on page 618 of the encyclopedia. And here on page 620, in the continuation of this entry, we find the comment made by Mr. Coyle that Albert Pike was the chief judicial officer of the KKK. So this is an official recognition of the roles played by two Masonic brothers, Nathan Bedford Forrest and Albert Pike in the formation of the Ku Klux Klan. And to conceal their involvement, the Masons who assisted in the formation of the KKK included a code inside the name itself. K is the 11th letter of the English language, as you can see by this table. There are, of course, three Ks in the name Ku Klux Klan, and 3 times 11 is obviously 33, a hidden recognition of the 33rd degree of masonry, just another coded example of their involvement in our lives. So just like many facts in this case, the truth was there for all those who cared enough to discover it for themselves. So the Knights of the Golden Circle planned a second civil war after the first one failed to meet its objectives and they started formulating plans on how they could bring it about. T.J. Stiles, in his book entitled Jesse James, The Last Rebel of the Civil War, discussed their plan on page 388. Their efforts included outright insurrection through organized mass violence. This was the period of the greatest outbreak of political violence in all of American history. And it had its effect, he continued. Citizens across the political spectrum feared that a second civil war would erupt. And Jesse James was right in the middle of it. And to pay for the anticipated costs of the second civil war, J. Frank Dalton told us, on page 239 of the book entitled Jesse James was one of his names, that the Confederacy, meaning the Knights of the Golden Circle, had seven billion, with a B, billion dollars in well-hidden gold reserves stored all over the West and the South. As I have said, Jesse James had become the leader of the Knights later in his life, and it was this money that he tapped into to build railroads and the copper mines in Montana and Arizona. As far as I know, Mr. Dalt never told the public why the Second Civil War did not come about as planned. So it's the fair to, it is fair to say that the United States is fortunate that it didn't. But it is also fair to say that if J. Frank Dalton was correct, Civil War historians will have to rewrite major portions of their writings. 
J. Frank Dalton used the $7 billion in gold when he moved to Butte, Montana under the name of William Andrews Clark and became a copper producer right when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb requiring huge quantities of copper for the wires to carry it. And when the automobile industry needed copper wires for all of the cars being produced. And William Andrews Clark became exceedingly wealthy. I have one more bit of history to discuss, one that I just discovered, oh, maybe a year or two ago. I remember reading that Dalton said that he was at the Battle of the Little Bighorn the morning of the famous battle, where Colonel George Custer and his 277 soldiers were all killed by the various Indian tribes assembled together. Dalton said that he had been running rifles to the Indians for several months prior to the battle, and that morning he had passed out over 2,000 repeating rifles to the Indians, and these were the weapons they used in the battle. According to the book, Jesse James, for one of his names, Frank Curtis, an employee of J. Frank Dalton, reported that, I was with Jesse James on June the 25th, 1876. And of course, that was the day of the battle when he, Jesse, passed out repeating rifles to the Indians who killed Custer. Custer's men had single-shot Springfields, which were no match to the repeating rifles that Jesse had given to the Indians. It is likely that for every shot that a cavalryman could get off with his Springfield, an Indian could get off maybe five or six shots. So this materially increased the odds against the men of Custer's cavalry unit. According to the book entitled A Terrible Glory about General Custer and the Bighorn, after eight or ten rounds, the extractor would tear into the soft copper shells, leaving the men to pry the shells out of the chamber. But the question is, why would Jesse James want General Custer killed? This is one of the books on the subject, and it was written by Craig Repass. Custer was informed that he had a real chance to become president and that he needed a sensational victory over Sitting Bull to stampede the delegates at the Democrat nominating convention, which was due to open in St. Louis on June the 27th, 1876, in his favor. Notice that Custer had to hurry because it was June the 25th and the convention was to open in just two days. So Custer and his 277 troops moved into a battle against the estimated 2,000 Indians at the Little Bighorn River in Montana, and General Custer lost. So in summary, the powers behind the election of an American president feared that Custer could become president. So they arranged a battle in which he would surely be killed. This is a book entitled 66 Years in Custer's Shadow that wrote about another book entitled The Aracara Narrative of Custer's Campaign. General Custer had 40 Aracara Indian scouts with his cavalry unit and in 1912, the last nine survivors were interviewed, and they confirmed the fact that Custer wanted to be president. They reported that Custer told Bobtailed Bull that no matter how small a victory he could win, it would make him president. They related what Custer told the scouts. If we beat the Sioux, I will be president, and I will take care of you when I come into power. But the most startling piece of information they shared was that Mitch Bauer, an Aracana scout, was the one who intentionally killed Colonel Custer. 
the Indian scout did not survive the battle as he was killed later that day. This is just another incident in this amazing story that has not been covered by the historians of the day. Now I will try to answer the question. And if they didn't want Custer to be become president, just who did they want to become president in the election of 1876? And it was Rutherford B. Hayes. And this photograph might reveal the reason that the bankers would want Colonel Custer killed. Please notice that President Hayes was giving a sign that he was a member of the Masonic Lodge. But he is not listed in this book of famous Masons, but the pose he is displaying is even more frightening. This is a sign of a 6,000 year old religion called the ancient mystery religion. Some of the others in the past who have displayed the same sign were Karl Marx called the father of communism. Vladimir Lenin, the communist dictator of Russia, and Joseph Stalin, the communist dictator of Russia who took over after Lenin died. If you want to know more about this religion and see photographs of probably 20 others who have displayed the same sign, may I suggest that you consider watching my 60-minute DVD entitled The Lion's Paw by finding it on the internet. So is this the reason why Jesse wanted Colonel Custer dead? So that the powers who select our presidents could make Rutherford B. Hayes president. But there's even one more clue that is quite likely the ultimate reason. As I have previously stated, Lincoln asked the Northern government to just issue the money to pay for the costs of the war. Lincoln's money was called the greenback, but it had one very unique feature that other money issued by nations did not have, and that was the money was not borrowed and therefore had no interest payments to make until the money was called in. And secondly, the money contained no promise to redeem it in gold. There were no such promises on the greenback dollar. This is an example of a promise to redeem paper money for gold. This is a $100,000 bill and the top and bottom lines read as follows. This is to certify that there is a deposit in the treasury of the United States of America, $100,000 in gold, payable to the bearer on demand. There was no such promise on the greenback dollars. After the Civil War, there were calls for Congress to pass legislation to redeem the greenbacks in gold, even, there, even though there was no promise to do so. What this means is that those who held greenbacks could get gold for them after the war, but not until Congress made them redeemable in that metal. So the bankers realized they could elect a president who would urge that these greenback dollars be redeemed in gold. And they were taking steps to make his election a certainty. One candidate in the election of 1876 promised to redeem the greenbacks in gold, and his name was Rutherford B. Hayes. And it could be presumed that the bankers would be willing to support his candidacy and willing to have any candidate removed who would not redeem the greenbacks in gold. And they knew they could get William Andrews Clark, a member of both the Masons and the Knights of the Golden Circle, to do as he was ordered because he had taken an oath to obey all orders from his superiors in both organizations. So Colonel Custer was deemed unworthy to be elected, and Colonel Custer was out. And Rutherford B. Hayes, who would redeem the greenback dollars in gold, was in. 
and he was elected president in 1876, and the bankers got gold for their greenbacks. Now it is time to finish this James story. And to do so, I would like to quote from a book entitled The Rise and Fall of Jesse James, written by Robertus Love, and he asked the final question about Jesse and his brother Frank. The Jameses, meaning Jesse and Frank, lasted 16 years in the matter of keeping out of the law's clutches. This author is claiming that Jesse and Frank had not been arrested for 16 years from approximately 1865 to 1882 when the historians believe he was murdered. But in truth, Jesse kept out of the law's clutches for 86 years from 1865 to 1951 when he died. So the question is, how was this possible? How did he succeed? The easy answer to this question is that the people of Missouri were afraid of Jesse and his gang. One of the authors I read addressed this question directly when he wrote, All Missouri was in terror of what would happen to anyone who gave information on the Jameses. <clears throat> and this is certainly possible. Mr. Love then urges his readers to find the reason themselves, but he does provide his readers with clues as to he reads the book. This is how he put it. The wise reader will read between the lines, where frequently the marrow of the matter resides. This author was telling his readers that the reason that Jesse and his brother were able to survive all of the bandit years lies concealed in the words of his book. According to him, the wise reader will have to figure this out for themselves. But Mr. Love does provide his reader a clue on page 285 when he talks about Jim Cummings, a reported member of the James gang. Jim, being of the Brotherhood, would remain silent like the others. The author does not, not identify who the Brotherhood is, but the Masons are often called the Brotherhood. And if he is referring to the Masonic Lodge, the Masons do take oaths as well to protect their Masonic brothers from harm's way. The 29th degree of the 32 in the Scottish Rite has this in its ritual. I furthermore promise and swear that I will aid and assist, cherish and protect a worthy brother knight, and see that no wrong be done him, if it be in my power to prevent it. And this must be the reason that Jesse was not arrested. He was a Mason. And Masons do not arrest Masons. And the reason is that Masons protect the reputation of the Lodge meaning they protect wrongdoers, because if it is found out that the wrongdoer is a Mason, it brings discredit to their organization. I would like to bring to your attention this book written by Charles G. Finney, entitled The Character, Claims, and pra Practical Workings of Freemasonry, published in 1869. As you can see by this cover, it says The Antichrist or the Masonic Society, but it's the same book. Of course, this book was certainly written within the lifespan of Jesse James from 1847 to 1951. So it is certainly a book that Jesse could have read. Reverend Finney has been called one of the greatest evangelists this country has ever known. He certainly could have been called the Billy Graham of his day. This is once again the book entitled 10,000 Famous Freemasons, and this is their brief biography on Reverend Finney, found on pages 50 and 51 of Volume 2. It says that Reverend Finney became a Mason in 1861 when he was 26 years of age, and that he was, quote, discharged at his own request, end quote, in 1824, eight years 
later. That means he left the Masonic Order on his own volition. And on page one of the preface to the book, he tells us why. He called Masonry a great evil. And the following are additional quotes he made about the character of Masonry. On page four, he states that Masonry is highly dangerous to the state. And on page 100, he calls the Masons conspirators against government. And on page 112, he tells the readers why they wish to seize upon the government and to wield it in their own interest. And on page 107, he summarizes his comments. Freemasonry is a wicked institution. Similar statements were written by John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, in his book entitled Letters on Freemasonry. He said this on page 124. Freemasonry is not the greatest, is one of the greatest morals, moral and political evils under which this union is now laboring. And on page 130, he said, Masonry is vicious, contrary to the laws of the land. And on page 218, he called Masonry a secret and lawless conspiracy. And on page 245, he added this comment, Masonry is, and it always must be, a conspiracy of the few against the equal rights of the many. And for the record, especially for those who declared that he was a member of the Masons, he stated on page 237 that I was not and never should be a Mason. But just before I close the discussion on the story of Jesse James being a Mason, I would like to show you two photographs which will show in a capsule form everything that I have been talking about during this presentation. This is the first of the two photographs, and you will notice that President Lincoln and two others are in what appears to be a soldier's camp sometime during the Civil War. But if you look carefully, you will see that the two men are giving the signs like we have seen being given by many others. This is the second of the two pictures, apparently taken a short time before or after the first one. And notice once again, the two men shown giving the same signs again. One of these two men standing near President Lincoln is Alan Pinkerton, the founder of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, and he is showing the sign that he is a member of the Masonic Lodge. And these are two photographs of the general showing that he is also a member of the Masonic Lodge. But here is the problem. Notice that in these two pictures, <coughs> President Abraham Lincoln does not seem to be aware of the signs being given by these two men in these two photographs. But it wasn't too much later that he ha would have an occasion to meet with another man giving the same sign by the name of John Wilkes Booth. And this is what happened to Lincoln because he apparently was not aware of the dangers from many of the men surrounding him. Now let me address the final evidence as to why Jesse was never apprehended by Alan Pinkerton and then the police authorities for 86 years. These are once again the two pictures of Alan Pinkerton, and these two pictures reveal the reason that Jesse was never captured by the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Both Mr. Pinkerton and Jesse were members of the Masonic Lodge, and as I have said before, Masons do not arrest Masons. So it is very apparent to me that the missing ingredient in the Jesse James story and in the Civil War is the Masonic Lodge. 
Now to draw this presentation to a close, I would like to repeat a thought by Mr. Dalton that I quoted before. He said this after he surfaced in 1948. The historians still haven't got it right. Maybe someday somebody will come along and set the record straight. This was my attempt at doing just that, setting the record straight, at least as much of it as I have been able to find. And I want to apologize for all of the inadvertent errors I've made on this DVD. I'm a man on a quest, but without all of the necessary skills, I need to satisfy my high expectations. But I believe that history will fairly judge my efforts. There you have it. The secret story as to how Jesse James lived to be 103. Thank you so very much. And may God bless America. This is a rather amusing photograph that has made the rounds of the internet some time ago. It shows a hunter sleeping with his rifle in his lap and a deer sneaking in while he is sleeping to eat his lunch. I would like to use this photograph to illustrate a point. We are the sleeping hunter. And while we are sleeping, the secret societies, the bankers, and the masons that we have discussed are secretly sneaking in to eat our lunch. And my admonition to you is this. It is time to wake up. Part 4 of 4.